Jesus is Lord. And he was such a nice Jewish boy. <laughs> Jesus changed my life. And he's still in the life-changing business. As Paul said, the love of Christ compels me. You know, Randy, I think most people don't realize how much darkness there is it, in it the world. It can't be just coming to church and getting pumped up with the faith. You message. and I are all going to have to have something of faith in us. For Jesus life. died to save sinners, and you are a sinner. I'm done storytelling, and I'm going to very quickly preach. Many people believe there is no place known as hell. They are uninformed and delusional. Hell is an unincorporated community in Livingston County, Michigan. <laughs> Their website has the perfect homepage. It says, more people tell you to go to our town than anywhere else on earth. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up, folks. It says, hell yes, we're open all year, even when hell freezes over. That's what it says. If you are going to hell, be sure and visit their Screams souvenir shop. They have sports memorabilia, which includes their own baseball bat out of hell. And it says you can stop at the Hell Hole Bar for what their menu calls a hell of a BLT. You can also get an Italian witch or what looks like a delicious concoction, the hellacious Cuban. But whatever you do, be sure to get the pin that proves you've been to hell and back. And finally, the one t-shirt that says it all, hell, we're all just seconds away. I'll come back to that in a moment. Hell is real. Have you heard of California? <laughs> now, like many strange things in California, there used to be a town called, you guessed it, hell. Some people are quick to tell you much of the state has already gone there in a handbasket. I, I don't agree. Some of Hollywood may be on the way, but hell, California, was actually abandoned over 60 years ago. The California State Highway Department bought the town of hell. And California legislators and bureaucrats seem to think they can control anything. They refuse to put an interchange there, literally making it impossible for anyone to go to hell in Riverside County. <laughs> Not making this stuff up. It would have been so much easier to simply point people to God, but that was not their viewpoint. And on September 7th, 1955, the LA Times reported it was 110 degrees in Los Angeles, yet only 105 degrees in hell. <laughs> yes, my friends, <coughs> Los Angeles was hotter than hell. <laughs> and the UPI once reported that it snowed there saying, you got it. It was a cold day in hell. <laughs> now, for the record, I'm not Catholic, but I did build a small Christian TV station in purgatory, literally. It's actually a beautiful town near Durango, Colorado. You don't have to go through purgatory to reach heaven, but you must enter there if you're going to hit the ski slopes or hike the Purgatory Creek Trail. <laughs> On a more serious note, Hell is more than a tourist attraction in Michigan or a footnote in the history of California. Hell is a place inhabited by those who failed to make their reservation in heaven. It's binary. You're going to go to hell or you're going to go to heaven. It requires a reservation. The help desk in heaven is not checking your gold, platinum, or diamond status in your travel rewards program. 
or your credit limits with Visa, MasterCard, or American Express. If you've not called out to the Lord and made your peace with God, your eternal home will have no peace. Only terror and everlasting tragedy. To be clear, those who foolishly believe there is no place like hell reserved for the condemned will believe it when they get there if God's simple plan of salvation to avoid hell is ignored. Now, there's a fascinating Jewish text I want to read you. It's from 1871. It's a paraphrase of the prophet Isaiah's writing from chapter 26, verse 19. And it expresses the simple choice of selecting one's destiny in the afterlife. Judaism does believe in a heaven and a hell and an afterlife. I, I gave a lecture at a respected Christian university, and it was a, for a world religion class, and the fellow who spoke before me was a reformed rabbi, and he told the people that Jews really don't believe in hell. He was mistaken. And there were some questions asked, and these were adult Christian students. At the end of his lecture, one of the students asked, well, if there's no hell, like, where does Hitler go? It was kind of a pathetic answer that he gave, and I happened to be pretty much wearing blue jeans and a T-shirt, even though I was the next speaker, so he didn't realize that I was the next lecturer discussing these things from a Christian viewpoint as a Jewish man. And it was a very odd situation, but that's a message for another time. The point is, this text, this is a, uh, a very valuable study from a Jewish perspective on the Isaiah text from 2619. God is recognized unquestionably, as the source of resurrection from the dead. That is a Jewish belief. That is a Christian belief. The resurrection from the dead, as well as the powerful force who will send you to hell if you transgress his word. And I'll read you the text. It says, Thou art he who does quicken the dead. The bones of their dead bodies thou dost raise up. They shall live and offer praise before thee, all that were cast into the dust, because thy dew is the dew of light to them who do thy law. But thou wilt deliver the wicked into hell, to whom thou hast given power, for they have transgressed against thy word. That's from Targum Joseph ben Uziel. Many people who declare they believe the Bible, and there may be some who hear my voice. Many people who declare they have faith in God, and there may be some who hear my voice. Some of them get weird when considering the reality of hell. They can't wrap their mind around belief in a loving God who would send people to everlasting suffering. It's a binary choice. It's a decision. Don't blame God. Of course, now those same people wouldn't want some unregenerate dictator, a tyrant, a madman, a murderer living in their guest room. But banishing evil, genocidal, violent monsters to hell seems extreme to some folks. It shouldn't. Hi, I'm Randy Weiss, and I want to tell you a little bit about a Passover backstory and our do-it-yourself Passover. These are incredible tools to help you discover the connection between the sacrifice of Jesus and the Jewish Passover. In the pages of these books, we not only share the prayers and rituals of Passover, but we provide a, a real guided tour of the Passover Seder. And you can hear the clear injunction that Passover is for Jewish and non-Jewish families using the scriptures to deeply explore and explain this festival. Get your copy today. 
You can find out more at www.doityourselfpassover.com. We're surrounded by a terrible adversary who wants our destruction. I think our adversary is constantly assaulting our mind. Satan has no right to damage you or continue his wicked assault. The Lord Jesus is calling us today to oppose the devil with prayer. We shouldn't be afraid that, that we're going to run out of our king's resources because they are endless. We just have to make sure that we're doing his bidding. We're doing what he wants us to do. We're doing it in the way he wants us to do it. And then he will equip and provide because he is good. His mercy endures forever. His resources are endless. God is on our side in any conflict with the devil. In any conflict between God and the devil, God wins, the devil loses. Isaiah, on the other hand, had no problem detailing how those in hell would respond to the arrival of the devil in hell or to the wicked leaders who were condemned to hell as their punishment for the misery they caused others. I'm here to tell you that the welcome wagon in hell is pictorially described in the Living Bible paraphrase when a guest of honor arrives in the land of the damned, and I will read it to you. The denizens of hell crowd to meet you as you enter their domain. World leaders and earth's mightiest kings, long dead, are there to see you with one voice. They all cry out, now you are as weak as we are. Your might and power are gone they are buried with you. Let me tell you something, my friends. Death and hell are the great equalizer of evil. The 14th chapter of Isaiah is quite well known. Immediately following the welcome committee speech that I just read, we see the words, and I will quote them, How are you fallen from heaven O Lucifer, son of the morning, how are you cut down to the ground? Mighty though you were against the nations of the world, for you said to yourself, I will ascend to heaven and rule the angels. I will take the highest throne. I will preside on the mount of assembly far away in the north. I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high. But instead, you will be brought down to the pit of hell down to the lowest depth. Do not doubt the reality of hell. Be aware it is real and it is inevitable as the result of the wrong binary decision. There are zeros and ones in a binary code. Zeros and ones, that's all that exists. Yes or no, saved or unsaved, heaven or hell. I'm sorry if you don't like reality. I'm not very much of a friend of gravity, okay? But I have learned to respect it. <laughs> it's real. I can't see it, but baby, I can feel it. That text that I just read is where we get the theological presupposition that Satan fell from his exalted position as an angel due to pride. And he rules the powers of darkness from his fiery throne in hell. Fortunately, that is not exactly what God's prophet said, and I believe it's not exactly what he meant. But don't get me wrong, Satan is real. He did fall from an elevated position due to pride, but I think it is a tragic exaggeration to crown him king of hell 
and to empower him as though he were a serious contender to God's throne as a lesser among equals of some sort. Satan is not a dark version of God like the good superhero versus the bad superhero. We don't have a Batman and a Dark Knight or a Peter Parker and the evil Spider-Man here. In fact, the description given by Isaiah puts Lucifer into a rather pathetic, diminished, humiliated state in hell. And Justice, I hope you appreciated that. That was for your benefit, my precious grandson. <laughs> because, you see, I am a cool grandpa. They, they call me Z for Zadie. <laughs> We're surrounded by a terrible adversary who wants our destruction. I think our adversary is constantly assaulting our mind. Satan has no right to damage you or continue his wicked assault. Lord Jesus is calling us today to oppose the devil with prayer. We shouldn't be afraid that, that we're going to run out of our king's resources because they are endless. We just have to make sure that we're doing his bidding. We're doing what he wants us to do. We're doing it in the way he wants us to do it. And then he will equip and provide because he is good. His mercy endures forever. His resources are endless. God is on our side in any conflict with the devil. In any conflict between God and the devil, God wins, the devil loses. I'm going to quote you another text from Isaiah chapter 14 verses 16 to 17 from the living Bible that some people suggest is not a real Bible but I don't care and I don't get paid to do this so <laughs> you think it bothers me if you don't like what I'm doing here <laughs> not even a little bit and, and you'll get your real preacher back next week good for you yay for me <laughs> okay He may be watching. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> you need to know something about me. I really don't care. <laughs> I have been preaching since 1973, and I've never gotten paid to preach. I work for a living, <laughs> okay? <laughs> And everybody knows, for preachers, it's just Sundays and fried chicken. That's their whole thing, you know? No. <laughs> Very seriously, I respect the people to whom I speak. But I'm not here to impress you, and I don't care if you like me or you don't like me. I preach to an audience of one. If, if I displease God with my words, I'm ashamed. If he's okay, if I'm, if I'm expressing what I believe he's shown me, then I just want him to be honored. Yeah. I want him to be made known. I want him to be revered because Jesus changed my life, and he's still in the life-changing business. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 16 to 17. Everyone there, we're, we're talking about hell, everyone there will stare at you and ask, can this be the one who shook the earth and the kingdoms of the world? Can this be the one who destroyed the world and made it into a shambles and demolished its greatest cities and had no mercy on his prisoners? For the record, I see this prophecy as twofold. I envision it like, Toto pulling the curtain back on the Wizard of Oz. The small dog reveals the weakness of the wizard when compared 
to the near omnipotent presentation portrayed to those who spent their lives fearing and revering the image of the wizard behind the screen. I think people see Satan as way more than they should, or maybe they see him as way less than they should, but they don't have a clear picture. And I think God puts it into a very correct interpretation, a more realistic interpretation of the first meaning intended by the prophecy from Isaiah, Isaiah in my opinion. He was also speaking to the immediate circumstance facing the Jewish people at that time. When Isaiah wrote these words and they were living in Jerusalem and Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, was taunting Israel. He was threatening the Jewish nation and he was threatening King Hezekiah. Certain destruction awaited Jerusalem if God failed to intervene, but God did intervene miraculously. And Assyria later became a conquered nation defeated by Babylon. Babylon is presented as a type of Satan in both the Old and New Testaments, and the prophecy of Isaiah was perfectly fulfilled in destroying the pagan kingdoms who had both brought death and destruction and bondage on the Jewish people. It happened. It was real. Similarly, Satan has been doing the same thing. He does the same evil stuff, and he's been doing it for millennia. But don't be confused by the devil's marketing team or the press who insist he's in charge of hell and perhaps in charge of earth in some ways. Now, he may be in charge of CNN. I don't know. <laughs> the devil will be a lowly, miserable resident in the eternal home of the damned, relegated there by God. But we don't have to go there. All who join Satan in hell will understand it was their defective relationship to God that condemned them to hell. It's binary. You have a right relationship with God or you really have no relationship with God. It's heaven or hell based on your relationship with God. The king of Babylon, wicked monsters like the various genocidal maniacs possessed by Satan will certainly be there too, but they won't be alone. Sure, the obvious suspects like Hitler, Paul, Paul Poe, Jim Jones, maybe Vladimir Putin, I don't know, there are people going to be there. But returning to hell, Michigan, for a closing thought, what about plain garden variety sinners? Will they be in hell? Their t-shirt is partially correct. It said, hell, we're all just seconds away. I think that's true. We're just seconds away from hell or seconds away from heaven. It's binary. You choose. I don't care. I've already chose, chosen. I, I, I've made my decision. Jesus changed my life. He's still in the life-changing business. What do you want? Where do you want to spend eternity? If your sins have not been erased from your account with God, you will pay the full price of your debt. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Eternity is closer than any of us know. We're all one heartbeat away. One slip and fall. I didn't hit my head. You may think. <laughs> We're not going there. We're not going to go there. If you refuse to make peace with God, you will make lasting friendships with the miserable miscreants who reside in that horrific place that many people assume doesn't even exist. It does. And it will be something you would really rather have skipped. If you haven't said yes to Jesus, you have returned your RSVP to hell informing them that you will attend the eternal gathering of the condemned 
in hell. But if you still have one breath left in your lungs, you can cancel your reservation in hell and rebook with a free upgrade to paradise. Choose wisely. God loves you. Satan will crush you. He will drag you to hell. He will do what he can to destroy you. My God is good. He loves you. He loves me. He will grant you favor and blessings. He will make a way for you in this fallen world, and he will make a way for you to be with him eternally. Don't be ignorant. Don't be proud. Don't be foolish. Choose wisely. In my life before Christ, I experienced several drug overdoses and several near-death experiences. I was an addict. I was a pusher. I was a miscreant. I deserved hell. Every one of us deserves hell. We may think we're pretty good. We're fooling ourselves because it only takes one sin to create a sinner. It takes one lie to be a liar. It takes one theft to be a robber. It takes one curse to be someone who's taken the name of the Lord in vain. It's only by the grace of God that I survived and I am here to tell you I'm thankful. I'm unashamedly thankful. By God's grace, I was given a second chance many, many, many years ago because God loves me. And every one of you has been given that exact same chance. It's binary. You say yes to Jesus. You can have your sins erased, your debt canceled, or I promise you, you will pay your own price. You will pay for your own sins, good, bad, or indifferent. They may be little sins. They may be big sins. They're damnable. That's what, that, that's the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm done. I will ask Pastor Rory to come up and uh, shut this party down and bail me out if there's still time. Thank you so very much. God bless you.